Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and I'm here today to warn you that Iridium flares are going extinct. Now, you might wonder what an Iridium flare is. Well, satellite watchers have been chasing these for like the last 20 years. Satellites can be seen in the hours before sunrise or just after sunset when they're high enough up that they're illuminated by the sun, but you, the viewer is still in darkness. Satellite flares in general are where a reflective surface on the satellite, like solar panels or antennas, reflect the sun directly at the viewer. Now, a faint satellite might brighten by a factor of a thousand, making it brighter perhaps than Venus or the International Space Station. Iridium flares were particularly special because their flares were predictable. The satellites had a standard configuration and they followed very strict attitude control. So the satellite prediction sites could go out and do the math and figure out exactly where the viewer should stand and at what time so they could see these flare. Iridium is a network of satellites provide satellite phone services and it was originally conceived in the 90s by Motorola and it started launching spacecraft in 1997. The name Iridium actually came from the original constellation design having 77 satellites which corresponded to the atomic number of the element Iridium. So the idea was the satellites were the electrons orbiting the nucleus of course the nucleus of the atom is way smaller than the Earth relative to the size of these things. But look, never mind. Point is, this was the idea, but as they developed the design and the technology and improved on the spacecraft, they actually figured out that they could get away with 66 spacecraft. Uh, and the name stayed the same regardless. They also kept another six or so on space to be hot spares in the event of failures. Uh, during the initial launch campaign, they actually launched about 95 because they had to account for failures of hardware and they were learning how this all worked. And actually, it's kind of interesting to look back at this because it was a really international affair with uh, the US Delta II rocket launching something like 60 spacecraft. Russia launched about 23 between the Proton rocket and the Rocket rocket, which we don't see very much about. And uh, the Chinese Long March rocket launched about a dozen of them. So anyway, the flares on the Iridium spacecraft come from the flat antenna arrays, not the solar panels, which most people think. Each antenna, there's three of them on it. They basically are flat surfaces and they project out or handle 16 individual beams, like uh, cells or areas. And uh, yeah, that means there's 48 little areas that they can cover and of course they're traveling across the world and they can switch between them in real time. But also Iridium was kind of pioneering in that it had inter-satellite links for much of the communication. So if you were phoning somebody with your super fancy satellite phone, it might go to a satellite and then be transmitted directly from one satellite to the next and then down to the next target. Instead of other systems at the time which would receive the signal and transmit it to a ground station which would then ship it across the planet Earth and find the, the local satellite. But yeah, that phone, that was a pricey piece of hardware. I believe it was something like $1,300 for a basic satellite phone. And then the service would cost you something like $7 per minute of talk time. They didn't really do internet access back then. It was very, very limited. Uh, and that's probably why people stuck with regular cell phones and Iridium couldn't really get enough of a market to make it profitable to cover the $5 billion that they spent building the network out. So yeah, Iridium unfortunately couldn't pull in the money and the company went bankrupt. But, you know, this is the US, they were able to restructure, get through that and a new version of Iridium uh, emerged and they continued to operate on the existing satellite network. Uh, now the network, of course, continued to operate. The satellites had an eight year lifespan in theory, but between 2002 and 2017, there were no new launches. So the spacecraft were clearly well enough designed that they managed more than double their productive life. But last year, yes, they started launching new spacecraft to add to the Iridium network. They used SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. 
The new network is called Iridium Next, and it's backwards compatible with the old phones, but it also offers a lot of new features. In particular, it offers proper data services now. And so in theory, you could get your Twitters wherever you are on the planet Earth. Matt Desch is the CEO of Iridium, and he's actually been a great asset to fans of SpaceX. He's frequently dropped like little nuggets of information on future plans of SpaceX or future hardware, which we haven't got anywhere else. So he's certainly been fascinating to watch. And it'll be a shame when Iridium's contract is up in the next uh, year, in the next few months, because they've had seven launches so far. They've put 65 satellites in orbit and only one more launch is planned later this year. But the new hardware is significantly different from the classic Iridium satellites. It doesn't have the three angled antenna arrays. Instead, it has a flat bottom with all the antennas in one sheet. And that means that it will never generate Iridium flares. The old satellites are getting taken out of orbit as the new ones come up, which means time is running out if you want to see what an Iridium flare looks like. And while some of the old satellites still remain in orbit, not all of them are functioning anymore. Some of them are actually still up there as hot spares, just in case there's new hardware problems. Uh, but when they're in hot spare mode, apparently the attitude control isn't as strict, so the satellite prediction sites have taken them off the books. So yeah, there's only a handful of them that are still producing the flares, so catch the phenomena while you can. Incidentally, an Iridium satellite uh, was also involved in the first case of a hypervelocity collision between two satellites. There was an old Russian spacecraft called Cosmos 2251. It was launched in 1993 and it uh, uh, supposedly it failed by 1995. Uh, well, in 2009, it collided with an active Iridium satellite in February 10th at a speed of about 11.7 kilometers per second. And understandably, both spacecraft were destroyed. And not just destroyed, they were smashed into over a thousand pieces of space debris. Now, you know, 10 years later, almost, about 300 of these pieces are still in orbit. See, because Iridium managed so many spacecraft in orbit, they were continuously having to deal with potential close approaches being predicted and they would have to make a decision in each of these cases whether they should make a, an orbit or a, make an adjust an, uh, an avoidance maneuver, change their orbit to avoid it. So Celeste Track, which is one of the clearinghouses, one of the people that track all the satellites, they had actually predicted using their Socrates system, which is a fancy acronym that I forget the name of. Yeah, they predicted that the two spacecraft would come within 584 meters. The data was obviously wrong and the predict the actual close approach was a little closer than that. But yeah, um, that's a whole interesting set of affairs. There's a really good animation that shows how the debris has spread out to cover the entire world. But yeah, Iridium flares, they are an endangered species and it's a really cool thing to see this satellite float along, along and suddenly get really, really bright for a few seconds before fading away. And it's a real shame that they are going to be disappearing in the next few months. So yeah, get online, check your favorite satellite prediction sites and look for these things and share them online. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.